Welcome back to Biology 2210 at CNM. Uh, we are talking about the nervous system, so we are in Chapter 12 in your textbooks. Last time we left off at objective number 52, and we had just finished describing the various types of uh, structural classes of neurons. So we know now that most neurons, approximately 99% of all neurons are multipolar neurons containing many dendrites and a single axon, and relatively fewer uh, neurons belong to these other classes. The second most common would be a unipolar neuron with a single extension, uh, which then splits into dendrites and axon, uh, again a single axon. Um, the dendrites are restricted to this uh, receptive area here, and the rest of this fiber is the axon. Bipolar neurons, which have a single dendrite and a single axon, and then the very rare anaxonic neurons, which only have dendrites and no axons. So that takes us to objective 53. And in objective 53, we start talking about the concept of axonal transport. Axonal transport is the passage of materials, be it proteins, organelles, really any materials, along the length of an axon. Now, as I mentioned at the end of the last video, axons can be extremely long, especially in motor neurons, and a single axon can be several feet long. And so we need a special transport mechanism to allow materials to traffic between the axon terminal and the soma, which would be located in the spinal cord. And so we have uh, many things, again, that, that must be transported, because remember the, the soma, the cell body, is the biosynthetic center of the cell. And so proteins, um, organelles, again, various uh, types of materials, neurotransmitter molecules have to be transported one way or another along the axon. Uh, this generally occurs along microtubules that run the length of the axon. Um, and they almost serve like train tracks along which uh, materials are transported. There are two directions uh, for transport. It is two-way passage of things. Um, transport from the um, cell body towards the axon terminal is called anterograde transport. Transport in the other direction uh, along the axon from the axon terminal toward the neuron cell body is referred to as retrograde transport. Some things are transported only in the anterograde direction. Some things are transported only in the retrograde direction. And uh, many materials are transported in both directions. Again, this transport involves microtubules that function as uh, train tracks. That's the metaphor I like to use, little train tracks along which um, transport can occur. Um, and the proteins involved uh, are the motor proteins that we refer to as kinesin and dynein. Kinesin and dynein. And so what happens is both kinesin and dynein have tertiary heads, uh, three-dimensional heads that can click along the microtubules, again like a train along, uh, along tracks, and as it clicks, almost power stroking like myosin heads in a muscle, they carry other materials with them. So they have a binding portion that binds to specific materials that we're trying to transport, and then a myosin head-like uh, protein that will allow the um, complex to crawl or click along the microtubules that run the length of the axon. Uh, kinesin tends to uh, transport things in the anterograde direction, and dynein tends to transport materials in the retrograde direction. Uh, the type of transport that occurs uh, differs a little bit between different kinds of materials that are being moved. So we have what are called fast transport mechanisms and slow uh, transport mechanisms. Uh, fast axonal transport can occur in both anterograde and retrograde 
directions. Uh, fast anterograde transport is used for things like organelles, enzymes, synaptic vesicles, and so on. Again, things that we need to very quickly be able to get out to the axon terminal from the biosynthetic center in the, uh, in the cell body. Fast retrograde transport is used for things like recycled materials that we want to quickly send back to the cell body, uh, such as, again, uh, neurotransmitter um, derivatives, so we can remanufacture them, recycle them, and then again quickly transport them back to the axon terminal. When we say fast, we mean rates of 20 to 400 millimeters a day. Remember, 400 millimeters is about uh, four tenths of a meter. And for most axons, that's a, that's a pretty good distance. Again, some there are some axons in the body that are longer than that, but most axons are shorter than uh, four tenths of a meter. And so, for um, most purposes, we can transport things to and from the axon terminal in less than a day using fast axonal transport. Unfortunately, certain types of pathogens have, uh, can take advantage of these transport mechanisms and hitch a ride on the dynein and the kinesin. And uh, this is how certain kinds of uh, viruses, especially, can migrate through our nerves into our central nervous system. They take the fast retrograde transport train, essentially, and can migrate from uh, where the breakout might be, say at the surface of the skin in the case of herpes, and migrate along uh, axons in nerves, and then take up residence in the central nervous system in the cell bodies. Uh, and once they're in the cell bodies, they become very difficult for the immune system to detect. They don't cause uh, much of an outward alteration in the appearance uh, of the neurons, and uh, because of the blood-brain barrier, there is some protection of the nervous system between, uh, uh, from the uh, immune system. And so they can actually reside inside the neuron cell bodies, sometimes for up to years. And then when the body is stressed or um, some other stimulus, depending on the pathogen, they might then migrate back uh, using the anterograde transport mechanism uh, back to their initial site of... Uh, of occurrence, and you can have what's called a recrudescence of the of the uh, disease. Uh, chickenpox uh, does this also. Um, chickenpox. So of course we know you have you get chickenpox and you have skin lesions, and then it goes away, but the virus can st again still survive in the central nervous system, and then in times of stress, the virus can migrate back to the skin and cause the secondary condition or the recrudescent condition known as shingles. Now, slow axonal transport, on the other hand, only uh, uh, can transport materials from about a half to ten millimeters a day. 10 millimeters is basically one one hundredth of a meter. So we're talking very short distances uh, per day, much, much slower. Um, this kind of transport is always in the anterograde direction, and it moves things that are not quite so essential to uh, traffic back and forth between the body and axon terminal uh, so rapidly. So cytoskeletal elements to maintain the um, tubules, for instance, just basic housekeeping. And if an axon is damaged, of course, it, it this can transport uh, materials used for replacement and repair of, um, of the damaged axon. And so damaged nerve fibers can uh, regenerate and can repair themselves. It's just that they do so fairly slowly because of the use of slow axonal transport in the anterograde direction. Um, and since I mentioned this, um, if you damage a nerve fiber, which is the axon, that doesn't necessarily destroy the neuron. Remember we said neurons are amitotic and don't replace themselves. But that doesn't mean that axons can't regenerate and regrow if they've been cut. As long as the cell body remains alive, there is the potential for the axon to regrow um, back to its original um, site of innervation. So keep that in mind, and we'll return to that idea when we get to the myelin sheath. Okay, so we've talked about the neurons. Now it's time to talk about the second type of cell, uh, 
in uh, nervous tissue, which are the glial cells or neuroglia. Interestingly enough, glial cells outnumber neurons by a factor of 10. So even though neurons are the functional cells of the nervous system, um, glial cells uh, are the more numerous type of cell, providing, again, supportive function. So again, about a 10 to 1 ratio means that there are about a trillion uh, neurons in the nervous system and perhaps as many as uh, 10 trillion glial cells. Um, glial cells, as we said, provide a variety of functions, supportive functions for the neurons. They tend to physically protect them and metabolically support them. They sort of uh, serve a connective tissue function within nervous tissue, forming a, a matrix or framework within which the uh, nerve cells can uh, reside. Um, in the During fetal development, um, secretions of glial cells will help stimulate neurons to grow uh, along certain pathways and they also provide a physical framework along which uh, developing neurons can can grow and they tend to surround and enclose neurons uh, again providing uh, once again physical and biochemical support Now there are different types of glial cells. There are actually six different types of glial cells. Um, four of those types of glial cells occur in the central nervous system and two occur in the peripheral nervous system. The four types of glial cells that occur in the central nervous system are the oligodendrocytes, the ependymal cells, the microglia, and the astrocytes. Uh, the two that occur in the peripheral nervous system are called Schwann cells and satellite cells. So we're going to start with the uh, four types that occur in the central nervous system. We're going to begin with oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are interesting um, glial cells in that they have many uh, cytoplasmic extensions that extend from a, a cell core. Um, so almost like an octopus with many arms, cytoplasmic arms radiating out from the center. Uh, the job of oligodendrocytes is for these various arms to wrap themselves around uh, axons, forming a structure known as a myelin sheath. Now we're going to talk about the role that the myelin sheath plays in just a few minutes. For now, we're just going to note that in the central nervous system, this wrapping uh, this specialized wrapping around axons uh, called the myelin sheath is created by a type of cell called the oligodendrocyte. Uh, you can also get myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system, but that's going to be a different type of glial cell out in the peripheral nervous system. Next, we have ependymal cells. Uh, some people refer to them as ependymal cells. Uh, I, I pronounce it ependyma. Um, ependymal cells are essentially uh, epithelial tissue, but uh, here, located in the nervous system, we consider them to be a type of nerve tissue, a type of glial cell. Uh, but they're essentially cuboidal cells, it's cuboidal epithelium, that is ciliated. Um, the job that these ependymal cells do is they line any hollow cavities or spaces in the nervous system and so that's again remember typical of epithelial tissue to line or cover surfaces um, and they also tend to secrete across their surfaces a type of fluid called cerebrospinal fluid now cerebrospinal fluid is ultimately derived from the bloodstream from blood plasma and so capillaries will leak out cerebrospinal fluid into the tissue space and then the cuboidal ependymal cells will pump that cerebrospinal fluid uh, across the surface into the cavity to create a fluid-filled space or cavity. Um, this cerebrospinal fluid carries oxygen and nutrients with it and so it becomes a surrogate for blood and help, uh, helps to nourish um, tissues that are exposed to it. And, and uh, if you're taking the lab you've already learned that there is an actual flow of cerebrospinal fluid through the through the central nervous system. It's not a static fluid. It's produced and it ultimately does drain away into the bloodstream as well. Uh, the cilia on the surface of the 
ependymous cells uh, are what create a flow of cerebrospinal fluid so that it can move from its origin to its ultimate drainage point and again uh, keep it from uh, becoming static. The third type of central neuroglial cell is the microglia or as some people say microglia. These are very small cells as you might guess from the name um, but relatively small because they're actually uh, monocytes a type of white blood cell called a monocyte that exits the, the bloodstream and be, takes up permanent residence in the tissue, in this case the nerve tissue. Uh, now we've already talked about what we call monocytes that leave the bloodstream and take up residence in the tissue. We can tend to call those macrophages. So microglia are actually a type of macrophage. They're just very small for a macrophage. But they basically do the same thing that tissue macrophage uh, cells do in other parts of the body, which is they wander through the tissue and they are on the lookout for any foreign bodies, any damaged bodies, any debris, anything that is not normal, anything that doesn't belong. And when they find it, uh, as is typical of macrophages, they will phagocytize it. And so they serve a cleanup role and a protective role for the central nervous system. Out in the peripheral nervous system we have regular old macrophages that are going to be performing this job in the in that part of the body. The last type, fourth type or last type of central nervous system glial cell is referred to as the astrocyte. The astrocyte. Um, this is the most abundant type of uh, glial cell in the central nervous system. Uh, it's found pretty much throughout the brain and spinal cord and uh, actually makes up most of the most of the tissue of the central nervous system. Up to 90% of the tissue in some parts of the brain, for instance, are made up of astrocytes. And astro, of course, means star. And so uh, star cells are named because of the, again, many branches, even more so than oligodendrocytes, the many branches creating a, a radiating star-like appearance of these cells. Uh, astrocytes have a wide variety of functions that they perform in the central nervous system. And you can see all the functions listed here. So um, physically, they kind of function like connective tissue, as I said earlier, providing uh, not just a, a binding supporting tissue that holds everything together in the adult, but also uh, creating a framework along which neurons can grow initially during fetal development. So they provide a physical framework that's very important in both fetus and, and the adult. Uh, again, they have many extensions that make them star-like cells. Uh, these are referred to as perivascular feet. And instead of wrapping around axons like the extensions of an oligodendrocyte might, uh, the perivascular feet of astrocytes actually wrap themselves around blood capillaries in the central nervous system. And what happens is this then creates or helps to form something called the blood-brain barrier. Um, by having this extra wrapping around the capillaries, we exercise much greater control here in terms of what uh, is able to diffuse into and out of capillaries. Uh, we take um, great care in controlling what happens at the capillaries in uh, the central nervous system because chemicals that can leak out of capillaries might affect brain function. Remember, ultimately neurons function by communicating with each other through neurotransmitter molecules. Well, there are some molecules that might mimic the effects of neurotransmitters or perhaps some other chemicals that might um, interfere with synaptic transmission. And so, nervous tissue is very sensitive to chemical disruption because of its dependence on neurotransmitters um, at synapses. And so we take great pains to regulate very carefully what kinds of materials can diffuse in or diffuse out of uh, especially brain capillaries. And so we have this extra, uh, not only do we have uh, very tightly sealed capillaries called continuous capillaries, but we have this extra layering of astrocytes wrapping themselves around the capillaries, providing us with an extra uh, layer of control for what moves in and moves out of 
capillaries. And so this is all known as the blood-brain barrier. Uh, of course, its design is intended to be uh, protective, again, to protect our brain, especially from rogue chemicals that we might consume and then make it uh, into the brain. Um, unfortunately, it does cause some difficulty when trying to administer medication to help with certain kinds of um, issues. Um, because the blood-brain barrier is difficult to get across, um, pharmaceuticals have to be formulated in such a way that they might be able to, to pass through. So for instance, if you want to administer dopamine uh, to somebody with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, uh, you can't just administer dopamine because dopamine, the molecule, cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. What you can do, though, is give them something called L-DOPA, which is a precursor to dopamine. L-DOPA can cross this blood-brain barrier, and then once it's in the um, uh, neural tissue, then it can be converted into uh, functional dopamine, an actual neurotransmitter. Uh, so the blood-brain barrier is a double-edged sword. It's, it's protective under normal, natural circumstances, but it, it does constitute a barrier that makes it difficult sometimes for pharmacological treatment of uh, brain uh, dysfunction. Um, as we said, glial cells also tend to um, influence or uh, assist neurons with their metabolic activities. And so astrocytes can re help regulate blood flow to neural tissues, especially um, uh, to neurons specifically, uh, by causing dilation and constriction, local dilation and constriction of blood vessels to match blood flow to the needs of the individual neurons. Uh, so in other words, neurons that are working more um, vigorously, we're going to dilate the blood vessels uh, serving those neurons and increase blood flow. Uh, metabolically, um, astrocytes can convert glucose to lactate and supply this to neurons. Um, um, and again, the, the biochemistry of that is probably a little um, too much to get into, but it's a metabolic type of support. Um, they can secrete nerve growth factors within the central nervous system. So again, if axons get cut, remember, they can regrow. And one of the things that helps them regrow are growth factors secreted by axons, which attract the, um, the regrowing ends of axons. Um, there is some ability to communicate electrically with neurons. So even though astrocytes don't uh, conduct action potentials, they are able to electrically modulate neurons a little bit, which, which does affect uh, what happens ultimately at synapses and uh, the, the effectiveness of synaptic transmission down, downstream. They control the chemical environment of neurons. Um, and again, they, they just do this by absorbing excess materials. Uh, of course, pH is something uh, we talked about. It's very disruptive to neurons. So they might buffer the, uh, the tissue fluid by absorbing hydrogen ions. Uh, we don't want excess neurotransmitters floating around randomly stimulating dendrites. Um, and so they can absorb those as well. So they generally maintain a homeostatic condition of the tissue fluid surrounding neurons. And then finally, uh, when tissue, brain tissue is damaged, uh, it's not typical connective tissue that forms scar tissue, but it's astrocytes that will essentially form a type of scar tissue and uh, fill in a damaged space in the central nervous system. Uh, like typical scar tissue, unfortunately, this is not functional tissue because astrocytes can't perform action potentials, but it does at least physically uh, repair the damage. So you see there are a wide variety of roles that astrocytes play in the central nervous system. Here we see uh, pictures of some of the central glial cells that we have described. We started again with the oligodendrocyte shown here in the center with its various octopus-like arms radiating out. And notice they each of these arms is wrapping itself around a piece of an axon and uh, eventually those wrappings will end-to-end -end form what we call the myelin sheath that wraps around the axon. Uh, we talked about ependymal cells, which are a, 
a type of cuboidal epithelium, lining, cavities, and again being ciliated to create movement of cerebrospinal fluid. Microglia, you can see are relatively small cells, um, also with lots of radiating arms, uh, but these are modified macrophages or tissue-specific macrophages that wander around the tissue looking for foreign bodies and abnormal uh, tissues to phagocytize. And then finally, we see the astrocyte, uh, very, again, stellate in its appearance with all these arms, serving its many functions of connective tissue, scar tissue, electrically influencing neurons, um, perivascular feet, uh, coding capillaries to create a blood-brain barrier, uh, etc. Okay, as I said earlier, there are two types of glial cells that occur in the peripheral nervous system. And again, these are called the Schwann cell and the satellite cell. The Schwann cell is uh, essentially the cell that performs or creates the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Now, it's a, it, does, it does so a bit differently from the oligodendrocyte. A single oligodendrocyte can send out multiple arms, as we just saw, and um, each of those arms can wrap around an axon. In the case of Schwann cells, they don't have multiple arms like oligodendrocytes do. It's a single pill-shaped cell, and the entire cell wraps itself around uh, an axon, and it does wrap itself around repeatedly, and this produces part of a myelin sheath. Of course, a single Schwann cell cannot produce a myelin sheath because, again, an axon might be, you know, inches long, maybe feet long. And Schwann cells are pretty typically sized cells. So it may take thousands to hundreds of thousands of Schwann cells arranging themselves end to end along an axon to create a, a myelin sheath. Um, as we will see in, again, just a few minutes when we start talking about the myelin sheath, myelin sheaths affect how quickly action potentials can propagate along axons, and myelin sheaths also assist in the regeneration of damaged um, axons. And this is true both in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. They affect speed of propagation of signal, and they help aid regeneration of cut axons, but we'll return to the myelin sheath and talk about it in some detail in just, just a few minutes. And then lastly, we have the satellite cells, the satellite cells. Um, the, there's a mistake in the objectives that I'm just noticing. We're on objective 68 right now. Objective 68 says, describe the role of satellite cells in the CNS. That's a typo because, of course, satellite cells are not in the CNS. Satellite cells are in the peripheral nervous system. And if you look at the rest of the objective, it makes that clear, right? It says surround the somas and ganglia of the PNS. So I apologize for that um, typo. But at any rate, that is the job of satellite cells. Remember, most neuron cell bodies are in the central nervous system. But occasionally, you will find clusters of neuron cell bodies out in the peripheral nervous system. And we said those clusters of neuron cell bodies are called ganglia. Well, a, the ganglion needs some kind of basic connective tissue to help hold things together uh, within the ganglion, and that is the satellite cells performing all the basic functions of glial cells, but instead of in the central nervous system, it's out in the peripheral nervous system. So they provide physical support and scaffolding. Um, they electrically insulate the, the neurosoma from surrounding conditions so that only the dendrites are to be stimulated. Um, again, they metabolically support neurons and regulate the chemical environment of the ganglion uh, so that the neurons function normally. So they provide uh, all the physical and biochemical support for the neurons out in the ganglia of the peripheral nervous system. And here we see a, a uh, histological view of Schwann cells. I, honestly, this is not the greatest view, but uh, essentially what you have here is a, a, a longitudinal view of a nerve, and you see a, an axon shown, this little band, this little cylinder of lighter color here, is the axon, very hard to see. 
and here you see the pill-like Schwann cells arranging themselves essentially end to end. So here's a Schwann cell, and then here's a Schwann cell, and very nicely here you can see the gap and then the next Schwann cell here. Um, so this would be a myelinated axon with, with a, a sequence of Schwann cells wrapped around it. There's, I think, much better drawings of this. This is, is kind of difficult to make out. All right, so I mentioned a couple times that we're going to talk about the myelin sheath in some detail, and so we are at that point right now. Uh, we are at um, objective uh, 69 at this point. So essentially, when we talk about a myelin sheath, the first thing we want to understand is that um, the myelin sheath is composed primarily of a lipid known as myelin. And you can see here that the myelin sheath is essentially the plasma membrane of either the oligodendrocytes or the Schwann cells. And remember what membranes are made of. They are essentially phospholipid bilayers with uh, various types of embedded proteins. So it's not surprising to find that a myelin sheath is about 20% protein and 80% uh, lipid. And that lipid is primarily a lipid known as myelin. Uh, its development, the development of myelin sheaths begins very early in development at about uh, week 14 of development. And um, its production is not really completed until late adolescence. So all through childhood, you've got the growth and development of myelin sheaths along axons in children. Um, this is why, as the objectives point out, it is not a good idea to uh, restrict the fat content of, um, or at least excessively restrict the fat content in the diet of children because lipids are an important component required to manufacture these myelin sheaths. Now, again, in the central nervous system, we, we talked about how oligodendrocytes wrap just portions of their arms around axons. But in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells themselves, the entire cell, wraps itself around the axon. And this wrapping is not a simple single wrapping. It's not like the Schwann cell just invaginates a groove and then the axon fits into that groove. The Schwann cell wraps itself repeatedly around an axon. So it, wraps, so it starts as a groove, but then the cell wraps itself around and then again, and again, and again, uh, over and over and over again, spiraling itself around the uh, axon. And as it does so, it tends to squeeze its cytoplasm, continuously squeeze its cytoplasm towards the periphery. And so what you end up with essentially is a layer of uh, a multi-layered level of just membrane. And it can be as many as a hundred layers of just membrane uh, with no cytoplasm between the successive wrappings of the membrane because the cytoplasm tends to continue to get pushed and pushed and pushed to the outside. Eventually, um, the cytoplasm will accumulate at the surface as it continues to get pushed, and that is referred to as the neurolemma. The neurolemma is the outermost coil, that very last outside coil of the myelin sheath, and that is where you'll find the nucleus and cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. But underneath that, it's just multiple wrappings of, uh, of membrane, composed again primarily of the myelin lipid, and that's why we call it a myelin sheath. Now, the, the entire sheath itself, the neurolemma, is of course connected to some fascia, uh, which surrounds it, some connective tissue, which helps hold it in place relative to other myelinated fibers. And uh, when you look at the structure of an entire nerve, you'll see that's called endoneurium, this connective tissue that helps hold myelinated fibers in place within a nerve. This is reminiscent of endomesium, which holds individual muscle, skeletal muscle cell fibers together within a whole muscle. And so we have endoneurium holding individual myelinated axons together within a whole nerve. 
This squeezing of the cytoplasm uh, towards the outside uh, is kind of reminiscent of, of uh, rolling a, a tube of toothpaste up as you use it. Now, uh, many of you may not be this precise about how you dispense your toothpaste, but um, one way to do it, of course, is to squeeze it from the bottom so you don't have any left over. And if you squeeze the tube from the bottom and roll the tube as you go, what you'll end up with, of course, is a a spiraled layering of the um, of the of the tube, the container itself, without any toothpaste in it. If you've done a good job, all the toothpaste, of course, gets squeezed as you continually roll the tube of toothpaste, gets squeezed towards the top. And so what you end up with is essentially what a Schwann cell looks like when it forms a myelin sheath, which is a, a uh, multi-leveled or a multi-layered uh, spiral wrapping of just the, the membrane or tube and all the cytoplasm or toothpaste just restricted to one area at the surface. That seems to be the best analogy that helps people visualize what happens as the swan cells wrap themselves around um, axons. And so here we see a diagram of a single Schwann cell longitudinal view. So the axon is at the center here. This In blue we see a single Schwann cell that, and again it's a section, so you're only seeing half of it. In reality it would come forward and, and cover the axon on this side as well. Um, but we do a cross section here so you can see that um, Next to the axon, you just have multiple layers of the cell membrane, the Schwann cell membrane, layer after layer after layer, with almost no cytoplasm in between, because all the cytoplasm has been squeezed to the surface. Um, and that's what we call the neurolemma, uh, is this surface layer of cytoplasm and organelles. Technically, the myelin sheath is only this, this part here, which is composed of uh, Schwann cell membrane. Here we see a different view that hopefully shows you successively how uh, uh, a Schwann cell can do this. Again, it starts by having a recessed groove into which the axon sits. Um, that's the beginning of myelination. And then the Schwann cell wraps, uh, you know, closes that groove and then overlaps itself and continues to spiral and overlap itself time after time after time and as it does so again cytoplasm gets squeezed from the center to the edge and by the time all is said and done again you have a multi-layered uh, level of membrane only that's the myelin sheath with a neurolemma or neurolemal sheath on the uh, the periphery and then as i just mentioned the the schwann cell itself the cell membrane of the schwann cell is going to be attached to some connective tissue called endoneurium, which will then connect this myelinated fiber to usually other myelinated fibers that would be uh, next to it. In the oligodendrocyte, um, uh, again in the central nervous system, it's a little bit different because um, it's not a whole cell that's wrapping but just an arm. And so a single oligodendrocyte is going to send arms out usually to multiple axons, not just one. So the whole cell can't wrap around a single axon. Instead, its arms, its extensions are going to wrap around several axons at a time. Um, so again, we see a multiple wrapping creating a myelin sheath, which consists of just myelin. Uh, but this time, um, the cytoplasm is, doesn't get pushed to the surface. It simply gets pushed back inward towards um, towards the nerve fiber or back into the oligodendrocyte itself. And so there is no neurolemal sheath in um, in the central nervous system. There is no neurolemal sheath in those myelin sheaths of the central nervous system. We also don't have endoneurium because endoneurium is a connective tissue and we do not find that in the central nervous system. So instead, again, remember it's astrocytes that are going to do most of the job of connective tissue. And so everything's anchored in place inside the central nervous system, primarily by astrocytes, not connective tissue. And here we see a diagram of how an oligodendrocyte might do its job. Here we see the 
the body of the oligodendrocyte with its multiple extensions and then each extension when it arrives at an axon will wrap around a portion of that axon creating the myelin sheath in that way. Uh, notice essentially it looks uh, the same as the myelin sheath of a Schwann cell but it's just not the entire cell that's wrapping. We also don't see a neurolemmal here where all the cytoplasm gets pushed to the surface because all the cytoplasm that does get pushed to the surface tends to just migrate or get pushed back up through this extension back to the, to the main cell so it doesn't accumulate at the surface here. So we don't see that neurolemma as we saw in the, in the peripheral nervous system. All right, as I've mentioned a couple times, it takes many cells to make a uh, myelin sheath for a single axon because axons can be so long. And uh, so that means that you have to line up these extensions or line up these Schwann cells end to end in order to create a myelin sheath. Um, there are small gaps between um, segments of the myelin sheath, between neighboring Schwann cells or neighboring pieces of um, oligodendrocytes and these gaps are referred to as nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. Um, these nodes of Ranvier, as we'll see, are very important. They must exist. If the Schwann cells or the arms of the oligodendrocytes were actually physically in contact with one another um, and there were no gaps in the myelin sheath, then uh, the, ax the axon actually would not be able to experience an action potential. It would essentially deactivate the axon, which is not what we want to do. So for reasons we'll see uh, a little bit later in this chapter, it's very important that these very tiny gaps uh, between um, neighboring cells, the glial cells, exist. So nodes of Ranvier, very important gaps in the myelin sheath. Internodal segments are simply the, the parts between the gaps that are actually covered with the Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes that actually have the, the myelin sheath on it. Um, the initial segment, something called the initial segment of the um, axon, is a short section between the axon hillock and the first glial cell. That is referred to as the initial segment of the axon, and so that is not myelinated, obviously, because we haven't gotten to the first glial cell of the uh, myelinated fiber yet. And then uh, together, we call the axon hillock and the initial segment the trigger zone, the trigger zone of the neuron. Um, what we mean by trigger zone is this is the first place where we are going to be able to initiate a nerve signal. Remember, a nerve signal is something called an action potential. So going back to what we said, remember we said dendrites cannot experience action potentials. As it turns out, most neuron cell bodies also can't experience action potentials. They can, both those things, dendrites and neuron cell bodies, can experience graded potentials, but they don't have the voltage gates required for action potentials. It's only, it's not until you get to the trigger zone, the axon hillock and the initial segment, that you finally start to see voltage gated channels and have the potential for experiencing action potentials. And so we call it the trigger zone because if an action potential is going to occur in a neuron, it is going to start, uh, it's going to initiate right here in this region. I don't think I've talked much about tumors um, in the uh, objective, so we'll just skip over this slide and leave that for pathophysiology. Um, again, not talking about pathophysiology, I just do want to mention one thing, though, that um, there are a variety of diseases of the myelin sheath which will of course disrupt the speed, especially the speed at which signals travel, and that tends to disrupt the coordination of the system. Uh, multiple sclerosis is probably the best known uh, disease of the myelin sheath, and that again disrupts um, conduction speed, which then creates a lack of coordination and control throughout the system.
Tay-Sachs disease is another disorder very similar to uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of degradation of the myelin sheath uh, involving an accumulation of uh, a material that disrupts the conduction of nerve signals within the, within the myelin sheaths. Um, this one has a hereditary foundation generally, um, generally affecting uh, people of Eastern European Jewish descent. Um, so you don't hear uh, about that one as much as multiple sclerosis because multiple sclerosis tends to affect a broader segment of the population, but no less damaging is Tay-Sachs disease. All right, well, as we said, axons may or may not be myelinated. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, what does an unmyelinated fiber look like? Well, you would think logically that an unmyelinated axon is simply just a, a free axon, an axon that has um, no association with an oligodendrocyte or a Schwann cell. In reality, an unmyelinated fiber is intimately connected with these glial cells, just not as intimately connected. So, for instance, in the peripheral nervous system, unmyelinated fibers are still associated with Schwann cells, uh, but instead of being wrapped uh, by Schwann cells repeatedly, unmyelinated fibers simply sit in grooves uh, in the Schwann cell. So it's almost like the beginning of a almost like the beginning of a uh, myelination, starting with that groove that we talked about. But then the cell doesn't ever actually progress to to wrap around it, and so the axon sits in a groove in a Schwann cell, but along its entire length, it is open or free to the environment. It's never completely covered, even in a even in an axon like this one that looks like it's completely enclosed, there is a groove here through which ions and other materials can pass freely uh, from the environment to the axon back and forth. Um, this sheath outside here represents the basal lamina uh, that would anchor this whole arrangement in place within the, within the, uh, the nerve usually. You'll notice that for unmyelinated fibers, a single Schwann cell can house up to uh, 10 or more axons sitting in their own individual grooves. Okay, so they're, they're not completely naked. They do sit in grooves in the Schwann cell, but along their entire lengths, uh, axons, unmyelinated axons, are exposed to the environment. And again, remember, to have an action potential requires the movement of sodium potassium ions very rapid into and out of the cell. And if, you're a my, if you have a myelin sheath around you, you're an axon that cannot experience that movement of sodium potassium into and out of the cell. Uh, for an un, At least not under the sheath. You can experience it at nodes of Ranvier, but you can't get ions flowing through the myelinated portion of the uh, myelinated fiber. Uh, in unmyelinated fibers, because they are connected to the surface through this groove that they sit in, Sodium and potassium are free to flow, uh, and uh, they're free to flow along the entire length of the axon, not just at nodes of Ranvier, because we don't have nodes of Ranvier technically in unmyelinated fibers. All right, so I've mentioned a couple times that the presence of a myelin sheath affects the speed of propagation of action potentials in the axon. So let's take a look at how, uh, at, in general, what factors determine the speed of a nerve signal uh, along an axon. And essentially there's two factors that determine the speed at which an action potential travels along an axon. And these two factors are the diameter of the axon itself so how big the axon is in cross-section, and as we've said several times, the presence or absence of a myelin sheath. Uh, for diameter, the general rule of thumb is the larger the axon is in diameter, the more rapidly uh, 
it will conduct action potentials. The larger the diameter, the more rapidly it will be able to conduct action potentials. And as far as the myelin sheath goes, the general rule is that myelinated fibers will conduct signals faster than unmyelinated fibers. Myelinated fibers are faster than unmyelinated fibers. So we can combine these two variables and create axons of different um, qualities. So for instance, your slowest axons are going to be your small unmyelinated fibers. Small unmyelinated fibers, right? Because you have two things working against you. Your small, which slows things down, and your unmyelinated, which slows things down. Now, what do we mean by slow? Of course, fast and slow are relative terms. Slow in this case means a half to two meters per second. One half to two meters per second. All right, and so uh, if we're at the lower end of this, like a half a, a half a meter uh, a second, um, that might be enough to even create a, a, a noticeable delay in in the body, um, because a half a meter is not that great a distance, and it would take a second to travel uh, that that distance. Um, small myelinated fibers are going to be, of course, somewhat faster because now they're myelinated and you see the influence that a myelin sheath has and now it's up to 3 to 15 meters per second much more rapid and then the fastest fibers of course are going to be the large myelinated fibers they have both qualities working for them large size and myelination and these fibers can carry signals up to 120 meters per second um, in the body in a typical human body, which is usually no more than two meters or so in length total, 120 meters per second is going to seem virtually instantaneous, right? So the, the time it would take to travel a meter or two would be a, a very tiny fraction of a second, essentially a hundredth of a second or so, and that becomes virtually instantaneous. Um, so we use these different types of axons uh, in different places. Uh, the slower, the smaller unmyelinated fibers, uh, the slowest of the fibers we tend to use in places where speed is not an issue. And so a lot of our visceral innervation where we're sending signals about some basic visceral responses, um, digestion, vasoconstriction and dilation and so on in the body, those don't have to happen on a dime instantaneously it's okay if there's a second delay in the signal we send say to the stomach to tell it to start churning to mix up food that we just ate a, a second of a delay is not going to matter in that case so where you don't need terrible precision great precision and instantaneous response uh, we can get away with these slower signals and that's actually fine for most of the body's functions uh, but there are some parts of the body where we need very fast, almost instantaneous kinds of communication. Uh, best example is to our skeletal muscles, where um, we are making moment-to-moment, -moment, virtually instantaneous adjustments to maintain balance and coordination. And of course, when we're actually doing something active, like trying to catch a, a baseball that's been thrown to us, we need virtually instantaneous adjustments to make sure we catch the ball and that the ball doesn't go, um, uh, that we don't react quick enough and then the ball hits us in the forehead or something like that, right? Um, so you can usually reason out where you would tend to find the fastest fibers and the slowest fibers. As we've also repeatedly hinted at, um, even though neurons can't regenerate themselves, axons can, as long as the neuron cell body remains undamaged. And so generally what happens if an axon it gets uh, cut or severed and um, at least some of the uh, neurolemma remains of the original myelin sheath, and again as long as the neuron cell body is intact, we can get some, some regeneration. So what happens initially, of course, is that the, the cut portion of the axon, the part that's not connected to the cell body any longer, 
doesn't survive and that simply degenerates within the myelin sheath. And macrophages, of course, in the peripheral nervous system will do the job of cleaning up that debris. If it happens in the central nervous system, this would be microglia that perform this cleanup function. Then what will happen is the neuron cell body will swell um, and uh, the neuron starts entering a, a, the neuron cell body enters a state of increased metabolic activities. Um, and that will then spur the axon stump, the remaining piece of axon, to start growing. And initially it grows multiple processes. So several pieces will start to grow um, uh, to replace the original axon. The remaining Schwann cells, which remember are usually still alive because cutting an axon doesn't mean you've killed all the potentially hundreds or thousands of Schwann cells that made up its myelin sheath. So technically the Schwann cells and that continuous basement lamina are still there and they form what's called a regeneration tube. And the Schwann cells will release uh, growth factors that attract the cut ends of the axon. And so the ends, again, several cut ends start to grow, several branches grow, but the ones that grow best are obviously the ones that are gonna go through the, grow through the original myelin sheath, through that tube, and eventually reestablish contact with its original effector. Um, the other branches that try to grow that don't have a myelin sheath to grow through really don't grow too well because of the absence of the growth factors. And um, they don't really, they, they grow in a kind of random fashion because they don't have a, a path to follow. So as we said, the myelin sheath is important not just because of its effect on the speed of propagation of action potentials, but myelinated fibers regrow back to their original destination um, much, much better than unmyelinated fibers will because of this regeneration tube, which is essentially the old myelin sheath that's uh, attracting the axon to regrow back through it. Of course, once contact is reestablished with the original target, the neuron cell body shrinks back to its original size because the added metabolic activity of regrowing the axon has now, um, has now um, dissipated uh, and everything goes back to normal. And of course, if it was a muscle cell that we were trying to regrow back to, once the axon terminal reestablishes a synapse with that muscle cell, uh, the muscle cell itself now in response to that uh, synaptic stimulation will itself then start to regrow. Uh, but remember, this takes a long time because we use slow anterograde transport to get the materials to the cut end of an axon. And so uh, the regrowth, again, it depends how long, um, uh, how long the original axon was and how far we have to regrow. But in cases of long axons, uh, sometimes it may take as much as two years for the regrowth to take place. Um, it is possible also that sometimes mistakes are made and the axon doesn't uh, quite grow back to the original um, effector cell. Not, it may grow back to the general area um, or it, it may simply just uh, get to the area but not to the exact cell to which it uh, originally uh, connected or synapsed with. There is some variability, there is some flexibility, luckily, in the central nervous system. And this is really the idea behind nerve grafts. When we do a nerve graft, we're essentially just trying to provide multiple regeneration tubes through which uh, cut axons can grow and reestablish connections with, their, um, with the distal end of the graft and uh, original effector organs. But again, uh, with a nerve graft, you're providing literally hundreds, if not thousands, of tubes through which axons, axons can regrow, and there's no guarantee that they're going to um, get back to their original destination. But the brain is a, an amazing organ, and it can learn and relearn um, these new connections. And as an example, I had a friend uh, 
I have a friend who um, many years ago was uh, discovered he was losing his hearing in his left ear. So I went to the doctor, and upon examination, they discovered that he had a tumor in his facial nerve. Now, the facial nerve is the primary motor nerve of the face, meaning it's the primary nerve that sends uh, signals to facial muscles, controlling things like facial expressions, etc. So they, um, uh, and, and what you may not know about the facial nerve is that on its way out of the, uh, from the brain to the face, it actually passes through the middle ear chamber. So it passes right through that chamber that contains the vibrating malleus incus and stapes, the bones of the ear that have to vibrate when the eardrum vibrates and translate those vibrations or transfer those vibrations into the inner ear so you can hear them. And so what was happening was that he had a tumor on his facial nerve and as it grew, it began to press against the ossicles, those ear bones which reduced their ability to vibrate, and that's what was muffling his hearing. So his hearing loss uh, was really just a symptom of a tumor that was growing on his facial nerve. So uh, they decided to do surgery, and the hope was that they could tease the tumor away from the facial nerve without actually having to cut the facial nerve, uh, because cutting the nerve, of course, would sever all of its axons. When they got in there, they found that the tumor was too invested in the neural tissue, and they had no choice but to, to excise it and cut the entire facial nerve. To help with the, uh, and of course, what that would result in then would be facial paralysis on one side, his left side, which is exactly what happened. Now, to assist in the regrowth of all those cut axons, they took a small piece of nerve uh, from his uh, superficial neck region and they use that piece of nerve as a nerve graft to attach the two cut ends of the facial nerve and so of course initially uh, he was completely paralyzed on the left side post surgery um, but over the course of and again this is a fairly short distance we're talking about um, from the cut part of the nerve in his middle ear chamber to his facial muscles probably no more than six to six to eight inches, right? So relatively short distance. And so within a year or so, it was clear that some of the axons had regrown back and he started to regain some movement of his facial muscles. However, um, because nerve grafts, again, provide many, many alternative uh, regeneration tubes to grow through, uh, many of the axons didn't grow back to their original muscles that they innervated. And so he had a very odd initial experience where as he regained, regained movement, um, the muscles on the left side of his face weren't doing what the brain was intending for them to do because the nerve pathways had been altered. And so if he would smile, for instance, of course the right side of his face would do all the normal smiling movements the left side of his face might frown or twitch or do something else. So it was a very odd kind of uh, manifestation uh, of what was going on to see the two halves of his face almost behaving independent of one another. But over time, his brain was naturally able to retrain itself and to learn how to send appropriate signals through the new pathways uh, to the appropriate skeletal muscles and he gradually regained some ability to um, frown and smile and do some of the normal facial expressions that we all take for granted uh, every day. Uh, it never became completely normal. Um, his one side of his face uh, still droops, the left side still droops, so he didn't regain full um, control, but uh, he gained, regained enough control to be to be functional and not not look like half of his face is, was perpetually paralyzed. So that's a little story illustrating how um, uh, regeneration can occur, um, but it does take a long time and it certainly uh, requires some regeneration to some myelin sheaths to make it happen. Okay, um, I think this is a good, uh, a good stopping point. Uh, the last objective that we uh, covered up to is objective 82. Um, and I didn't mention anything about it, but in Objective 82, just note that damaged nerve fibers in the central nervous system 
don't regenerate at all because um, the myelin sheath doesn't form a regeneration tube. Oligodendrocytes don't secrete uh, growth factors uh, that attract growing axons and they don't create a nice intact regeneration tube. Uh, so in the central nervous system, we don't get axon regeneration, unfortunately. All right, so that's a good place for us to stop. Objective 82, when we pick up next time, we will start talking about um, action potentials. And uh, we'll go into the phenomenon of the action potential in a little more detail than we did when we looked at the central, I'm sorry, when we looked at muscle contraction. So we've already talked about action potentials a little bit. We're just going to talk about them in some more detail than we have already. So we'll pick up with objective number 83 next time. Until then, stay safe, and we will see you on the next video.